On today's episode, we're talking about solar power. Hi, I'm Danner. I'm a computer engineering student from Huntsville, Alabama. When I was a kid, my family built this shed in the hills of Southern Tennessee. It sat dormant for nearly 20 years and began to deteriorate. I'm currently on a mission to restore the shed and convert it into an amazing tiny house. With the help of my dad, I'm learning the basics of construction, restoring the land, and documenting our story. This is Abandoned Shed to Tiny House. So today we're going to be talking about solar power. If you watched my last video, I gave a brief introduction to our solar system that we've created. And today I just want to talk about solar power in general and hopefully it can help you guys understand some of the choices we're making and what we're going to be doing with solar in the future. So what is solar power? Well, you have solar panels and the sun shines on them and it produces DC electricity, which comes out in two wires and you have a choice to make. Do you use the power? Do you store the power? Or do you send it off to the grid? If you're new to solar energy, the solar panels generate electricity during sun exposure. From there, the power needs to be routed somewhere, and that's the job of the solar charge controller. From the charge controller, the power is sent off to home appliances or stored in a battery or sold off to the power company. Solar panels are the first component in any solar power system. There's many variables, panel size, panel construction, the location, and sun angle. Some people even construct elaborate sun tracking systems. We chose to take this project stepwise and keep it simple. We know that the system will change and evolve, but that's an opportunity to dig a little deeper into the technology for those of you interested. Right now we have our first 400 watts of power coming from our four 100 watt panels, and we plan to add more as our power demands increase. Solar panels generally are placed in three categories based on manufacturing used to produce the individual cells. Monocrystalline, polycrystalline, and thin film. Monocrystalline solar panels are the most efficient and also the most expensive to produce. Individual silicon cells are cut from a single silicon ingot. You'll recognize the black color and distinct crop corner shape of the solar cells. Polycrystalline solar panels are generally less expensive, but they're slightly less efficient. These cells are formed by molding a blend of silicon pieces together. They have a blue shade and you can usually see the texture of the smaller pieces used in construction. Thin film technology is the least efficient and least expensive, but this technology has been catching up in recent years. The conductive material for the solar cells deposited in a thin film on glass or plastic. These can even be made flexible as is often seen on boats and RV installations. We're currently testing four rich solar 100 watt monocrystalline panels. We used rare earth magnets to temporarily mount the panels to the metal roof so that we can test various locations and electrical configurations. When we install the final roof and have better data on panel location, we'll finalize mounting design to something more permanent. Here's our rich solar 40 amp charge controller and this is like the brain of the whole solar system. We have this line that comes down from the solar panels and they go right into this port that says solar. Then we have a battery port and this hooks up to the batteries and it'll charge the batteries and manage them. And then we also have this DC load port where we're going to be hooking up this little fuse box. This is like the fuse box you have in your car and it has these little blade fuses like this. And we're going to be doing some little light circuits or Oh, it's upside down. <laughs> uh, we're gonna be doing some little light circuits or uh, USB chargers that we can hook into there. This is our inverter. I'm gonna come back to that in a little bit. This control screen shows you the state of the battery charge and the status of everything going on. Right now it says we have 12.6 volts on our batteries. And we also have some lights and stuff hooked up right now. And some of that power right now is coming directly from the solar panels and some is coming from the batteries. And as it, the day goes on, it is close to evening right now, um, it's going to start going more and more from the battery and less from the solar panels. We also got a little module that hooks up to the charge controller and it gives it Bluetooth capability. And so now I can check the status on my phone and I don't have to check the screen directly, but I can see that it's 12.6 volts right now and the temperature. And we can also see some historical data on the app as well, which I'm not sure if you can see that directly on here, but it's uh, definitely made it a little bit more convenient. So here's where our power comes down from the charge controller into our batteries. 
These are our two lead acid batteries, and you can see that we have them in parallel, positive to positive and negative to negative. And we have them hooked up to a bus bar so that we can hook everything together. We can have our inverter going there, batteries going there, and anything else we need connected to the battery, we just hook up to these bus bars. We also have a shunt down here, and this leads up to our little monitor, and this will show us the current power that's draining from the batteries. And we got a few of these little meters and we're gonna be hooking them up in various places just so we can uh, see all the power in different spots. Like maybe we put one on the inverter and we can see how much power the inverter is using. But yeah, this one right here is just showing that right now 122 watts are coming from the batteries. Um, right now we have some lights hooked up, so that's what's taking that power right now. So let's talk about batteries now. Um, we have both lead acid and lithium iron phosphate batteries. And we saw a couple of comments about these and we had some questions about them ourselves. There's a lot of conflicting information about, out there about these and we have both now. So we wanna do a couple of tests and see what we can figure out about these. Remember we need batteries to store energy during the day for use at night or on days with low sun. Batteries are also used for power surges that exceed power the panels are putting out at any given time. Sizing batteries can be a challenge and we're using a stepwise approach in building our final system. There are three main considerations in sizing batteries. Depth of discharge. This means how low the charge can drop before they must be recharged. Days of autonomy. This is how many days in a row you're counting on bad weather or low sun days or the total power surge and amount of energy consumed in a day. While some people can count on having the grid in times of low sun, our current plan is to use a generator as a backup to solar power. A generator not only powers things directly, but it'll also recharge the batteries. So that brings us to the question of how much power do we need each day? We don't know an exact figure yet, but it's not uncommon for a house to use 20 to 30 kilowatt hours per day. Our generator can produce that in about eight and a half hours. We know loads like air conditioning, refrigerators, air compressors, and power tools can be power hogs. And we're taking full advantage of being able to scale up power demands and we'll document the various electrical appliances as they're added. We also want to use one or more generators to supplement when power demand surges. And in a worst case scenario, we can just hook up to the grid as a backup. Our initial setup uses two 100 amp hour lead acid batteries. These Group 31 O'Reilly Superstart Deep Cycle Marine batteries were under $200 total and provide 100 amp hours each or 200 total amp hours. Because these are lead acid batteries, we'll use 50% depth of discharge. This will extend the battery's life and avoid over discharging. So effectively, we have 100 amp hours of useful power available from the lead acid battery bank. We also bought a pair of 12 volt lithium iron phosphate SOK batteries that are also rated at 100 amp hours each. But since we can regularly discharge them down to 80%, they provide 160 amp hours of power. Comparing the 100 to 160 amp hours at 12 volts, that's 1200 watts of power from the lead acid versus 1920 watts in the lithium iron phosphate. This 720 watt advantage from the SOK lithium iron phosphate batteries will help. Keep in mind we might need 10 times this daily if we're using only solar for a fully off-grid system without restrictions. Our goal is to be extremely efficient as we design and add electrical components to the house. Another point comparing our lithium batteries to lead acid is they can be cycled thousands of times more and discharged to a lower voltage with less impact on charge capacity. Of course, both battery types can be abused and performance will be degraded. And these batteries don't usually just die all at once. You can think of it more like your phone where it doesn't hold a charge like it used to. Since both of our 12 volt battery sets were purchased new and manufactured within a month or two of one another, we'll use them interchangeably to document the performance and report back as we learn more. Before leaving batteries, let's discuss how they're connected to the system. We can arrange the battery bank in series or parallel or even combinations of these two. In doing so, one can increase or decrease the overall battery bank voltage or amperage based on configuration. If we take two 12 volt batteries and connect them positive to positive and negative to negative, this is parallel and they'll still produce 12 volts, but we get twice as many amp hours. If we hook the batteries positive to negative or in series, then we double the voltage to 24 volts, but the bank still has 100 amp hours. In parallel, we add the current and series, we add voltage. Note that in series or parallel connection, the power is calculated by multiplying amps times volts and we get the same total 2400 watts. We mentioned that we have a couple inverters that we're gonna be testing. Remember that an inverter converts DC to AC like you have in your house. And we have a 1200 watt pure sine wave inverter and a 750 watt modified sine wave inverter. 
And I'm not gonna really go too far into details on these right now because we plan on upgrading these, but right now it's just a way for us to use a couple of appliances before we upgrade. And I'd really like to take a closer look at both types of inverters. Um, we can hook up an oscilloscope and look at the waveform and figure out what the major differences are between them. Well, I hope that simplifies solar power a little bit. And it just occurred to me that these little landscaping lights from our garden are like a small version of our solar system. You can see if we open one up, it's a solar cell attached to a charge controller with a rechargeable AA battery. And at night, it'll turn on this LED. And really our system isn't that much more complicated than this thing. So yeah, I just thought that was pretty cool and I wanted to share it with you. We still have a lot more work to do with our solar system, but I hope that you learned something from this. And let us know if you like this more in-depth explanation style. I also wanted to announce that I just set up a Patreon page and I'm gonna be putting the link down in the description. And I'm gonna be doing something special for my first 10 patrons, but either way, I'm very thankful for all of you who are watching and subscribed and we appreciate your support. But I think that's gonna be a wrap for this video, so I will see you guys next time. Solar power. Other side. Solar power. Thank <music> you.